we close out our series today in the short but powerful and impactful letter of James to the early church. The series has been called Faith That Works, play on word that faith does work, but faith calls us to work, and they go hand in hand. Faith that doesn't work isn't faith at all. We are God's workmanship to do the works that He has prepared for us to do. So that's what we're going to do. I've subtitled the entire series of evidence of genuine faith, and I think this is what the world would look at, certainly what James is saying the church needs to look at, but the world will take a look at our life and say, you know what, something is different about that person. They say they have a faith in Christ, and it's being lived out. Their trust in God, their dependence on God, the wisdom they have in God, the way they close their mouth and not get yelling and screaming and angry and can't control their tongue, the way they handle their and manage their wealth and the way they don't treat one person better than the other person but love all people equally. All these things are evidences of genuine faith. I've tried to share with you an outline that the first chapter is all about our relationship with God that prepares us for the work we have with others. Chapters 2, 3, and 4 are about how we handle other people in the strength of the Lord. And then chapter 5 is a bookend of, okay, you've been told what to do. Let's go through those things kind of briefly again, but I want you to understand you can't do it on yourself. You must depend on the Lord to help you in this. So we start with God, we end with God. We abide with God, we depend on God. And in those two ends, those two bookends, we can Deal with people and situations and storms and struggles and afflictions and all the things of life because we are surrounded in our own heart with the beginning of abiding in God and in the end, depending on God. I don't know about you, but I've spent a few hours in my life, I call the midnight hours of tears, for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes they are health reasons. I remember when Brittany, at the age of 10, our daughter, was in a sledding accident and died in my arms, and through the course of miracles, God brought her back to us. But in that moment, my heart was crying out to God. All I could say is, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And that hour was a long hour. That night was the longest night. So many tears of wondering if she was going to make it. We're so grateful the Lord allowed her to remain with us. Other times of tears and sorrow is in times of wondering what the Lord's next path for me was in vocation and ministry, and, no, and the doors were open, but they were shutting for no fault of my own, but outside situations, and I'm saying, Lord, what are you doing? What do you have for me? Uh, wh- where do you want me to go? How, how will I bring about um, provision for my family? And many hours in those nights, I was crying out to the Lord saying, I need your guidance, I need your wisdom, please direct me. Maybe you have gone through those midnight hours of tears as well. You know, Jesus says He is light. He says He's the way. He told us that God is love. And so the world likes to think of God as only love. Love, 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 love. It's all love, love, love. And if we're going to be like God, we're going to love, 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 love. We neglect to think about God's love and we see Him as a shepherd caring for us, but not just a shepherd who cares for us, but the power of a Creator to protect us and guide us and to be with us in our darkest hours. It's yes, God is love, but in that love, He is powerful. So when you're going through your midnight hour, maybe you've got a loved one on death's door. God's love remains strong if He takes them home or if He keeps them with you. Because His power is sufficient to heal them or take them. But His love does not change. That is not the tipping scale of, well, He must not be a loving, good, powerful God because He allowed the storm to rule in my life and I've lost a loved one, I've lost a job, I've lost a friend, I've lost a marriage, I've lost my health. 
How can God be loving? How can God be powerful? I'm here to tell you, He is all of that. But as we who have to lean into Him and recognize that His powerful love will see you through the storm, that it may not answer the prayer you want to be answered. So we have to depend on Him. He alone is trustworthy to be dependent on. Now, chapter 5 deals with four topics. Some of them are topics that James has already dealt with at length. We won't spend a huge amount of time on them today, but he is revisiting those in light of, are you depending on God? In this arena, is God preeminent in your life? And he starts off with, are you depending on the Lord for your livelihood? Verses 1 through 6 in James chapter 5. He has already dealt with how the church handles wealthy people and poor people coming in and how we're not supposed to treat one better than the other. Wealthy people have all the blessings they have on earth, and so they're the lesser because those who suffer will experience the glory in heaven in a greater way just by comparison. But he calls back to that text and says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. And their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasure in the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which kept you back by fraud and crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You've lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. That's a pretty hard word against the wealthy. Know that Jesus isn't saying and James isn't saying that wealth is a sin. Money is not evil, but the love of money is The seeking of money outside of following God's guidance is. It's a matter of stewardship. And what James says here is all the gains you have outside of Christ are garbage. They're going to rot. They corrode. They're going to disappear. Every treasure you've ever acquired for yourself is nothing but garbage, moth-eaten. So how for it? Our wealth is nothing in the sight of God. He says, not just are your gains garbage outside of your focus in Him and how you treat others, but your treasures will only torment you. He says, they're corroded. Their corrosion will be evidence. They'll be a witness against you in the day of the Lord. So if we focus on our wealth as anything other than something to be stewarded by God, that will be a witness and evidence against us in the last day. Because that's where your focus has been. If you want to spend your time on earth focusing about wealth, guess what? You're going to spend eternity focusing about the wealth as it is rotten and corroded and will witness against you that you foolishly squandered your life that God gave you and the opportunity for stewardship with all that He gave you. It'll torment you. He also says that your fraud will be fattened for the slaughter. This fraud is against your employees against those who work for you, cheating them, becoming wealthy and not providing anything for them, making the work environment intolerable. It says you lived in luxury, self-indulgence, and you fattened your hearts in the day of the slaughter. You see, the treatment of your employees matters to God. He hears their cries against you. We're coming into the Christmas season, and every year when my children were young, we would read a Christmas carol by Charles Dickens. And uh, Brittany would want me to read that aloud to her three or four times a season. I think I might almost have it memorized. It's one, one role in community theater that if I was asked to play it, I'd probably go back and play that role. Well, you know the story if, you know, if you've ever read it or seen it on television in a movie form. The Scrooge is a tight, wound guy who loves his money. In fact, the text says he was tight-fisted had a tight-fisted hand, and as a grindstone, he would squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, sharp as a flint about money. I love the contrast, and in fact, my favorite character in there is not Cratchit, it's not Tiny Tim. 
It's not Ebenezer, though I love the transformation that takes place in his life. It's a little, jolly, fat employer named Fezziwig. He is my favorite character in the entire story. He doesn't make a whole lot of money, but he provides for his family. But he is a jovial guy who loves his employees, and one of the spirits takes Scrooge back to his early days of working as a clerk, and he reminds him of the situation that a party was being thrown, and the tables were set aside, and musicians came in, and the food was plentiful, and the dancing started, and they talked about Fezziwig and his wife and how they danced every single dance, but they made sure everybody had a partner, and it was just nothing but fun. And the spirit asked Scrooge, he spent a couple of coins on this. Not that big of a deal. In fact, he says this, Is it not a small matter of coin to bring happiness? Yes. Small. Why is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. It's small, isn't it small? And Scrooge wakes up a little bit and goes, no, 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 that's not it, Spirit. That's not it. He says, he has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that His power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it's impossible to add and to count them up. What then? The happiness He gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. What a contrast to our text where the employer is making life so hard for the employee. Think back on the jobs you've had and the environments you worked in, and what made them wonderful or what made them horrible. Oh, you might have made a little bit less in the environment that was pleasant, but those days were glorious days, wonderful days. We ask our question, I spend a little bit of time on this idea of livelihood and what your life means in stewardship and why is money important? Do you realize that the Bible... It's packed with over 2,000 scriptures on money, tithing, possessions. That's twice as many Bible verses about money than faith and prayer combined. So it must be important. And the heart of the matter is this, that money can bring something that rules our lives and idols of sort, and so God wants to deal with it and says, do not allow this to be an idol in your life. Because his desire for us to have a life that's full. And he knows that if we worship money, that'll keep us from that. It's a seduction. Success is a a seduction. It's a lure of lust. Matthew 6 says, no one can serve two masters. Either we will hate the one and love the other, we'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So the idea is that God blesses you. He gives you this. He thinks it's important. He put more verses about it than anything else, but it's about stewardship. And so why is this stewardship so important? Well, 16 out of 38 parables that Jesus mentioned was about money and possessions. About 25% of the words of the New Testament that Jesus said was about stewardship. In the words of Jesus, He says, for where your treasure is, Out of Luke 12, your heart will be also. So we look at this text and say, man, is he hard against these people who are all about their money and hoarding it together for something. And in the end, when we get to our maker and we're held account, it washes away. But God has some principles for us in relationship to money. They're there in your notes. They're up on the screen. First, he owns everything. All things under the earth, below the earth and above the earth are his. Money is about discipleship. Whose disciple are we? Who are we being obedient to with that? We worship God with our finances in giving to this mission, that ministry, this work, that person. 
We do this because God knows that the principle when it comes to stewardship is we fight in our souls about contentment. That enough is never enough. The more we have, the more we want. The more we get, we've got to upgrade into a larger home with a larger payment. A better car with a larger payment. We want our toys to be new. Christmas is coming around and that 85-inch L, that, uh, plasma TV is waiting for you. And that's what we do because we're not content. He knows that the principles about money are important because it kills greed in our hearts. It makes us mindful of debt that we hold. He teaches us to manage our finances because we're going to be held accountable. Job 41.11 says, Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. God is saying, listen, I gave it to you. I took it away. It's all mine. You need to learn the lesson. You're serving the wrong master. It's not just about your livelihood. And I know you might be praying, what's the next stage of my life? In retirement, what do I do? If I'm early on in my, in my career, in my 20s, what's my calling? God will guide you. He will lead you. He'll open doors for you if you follow him. Make sure that money is not your sole achievement and goal. The next area of James in dealing with this is dealing with patience, and obviously we dealt with this in the passage of controlling your tongue and learning how to fight well and quarreling and how we deal with that. But this idea of patience, he's saying you're going to have to lean into God and depend on God in those moments that call for patience, patience in several areas. Let's look at this text. Verses 7 through 12 says, be patient therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any oath, that your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. We are meant to have patience for His return Twice in here, he brings up the Lord is at hand until he returns. The coming of the Lord. And what he says is, you need to just not worry about this, but be patient. We know in other texts that the patience we're supposed to have is because God wants to draw others to him. There are more that need to come to him. But it's interesting to me that he says this about this topic establish your hearts. There's the key of depending on God when you're going through situations that have you at unrest and unease. Your heart must be established in the Lord. The end will come. That's why you and I can be an optimist. The Lord will come. I can smile about that happening because I know that I'm His and He is mine. Billy Graham said this, the end will come with the return of Jesus Christ, and that's why a Christian can be optimist. That's why a Christian can smile in the midst of all that's happening. We know what the end will be, the triumph of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, be patient about His return. Establish your hearts for this. He says, have patience with others. We spent a long time, several messages on this topic, but in this he says, do not grumble, do not judge them. He says, have patience in the Lord's compassion. We dealt with this the other week when it came to judging other people, because you'll be judged as you judge others. You'll be shown mercy as you've shown mercy to others. And so as you walk through these things, you have to understand that the Lord is merciful and He is compassionate. He gives the example of the prophets. They were steadfast. They had patience. Think about Jeremiah. Here's someone who endured mistreatment. 
He was put in stocks. He was thrown in prison, lowered into a miry dungeon. Yet he persisted in his ministry. Think of Isaiah when he sings this, and Isaiah goes through struggles, and all these prophets have gone through struggles. He says, sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted His people and will have compassion on His afflicted. Oh, by the way, you're going to go into exile. Hebrews 4 says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. I love this thing he says about Job. This verse he says about the steadfast, and he uses this phrase, seen the end intended by the Lord. It might be the hardest thing for us to do when it comes to going through our sorrowful moments and our struggles. What is the end that is intended by the Lord? We know it's compassionate and merciful, but so many times we go through a sorrow and a struggle and we say, I see no compassion. I see no mercy. I do not see what you're intending. And it's so true that we may not have that answer. I have no clue as to why these sorrowful things happen in our lives, why these struggles happen, except for going back to James chapter 1, what it says, these things build our faith that we might be more perfect. We need to have patience in the Lord's promises. What He says, He says. What He means, He means. You've got to hold on to these things. And when we do that, we won't need to be swearing by this or that or saying, I'm going to, I'm going to swear by heaven or swear by earth. Just let your yes be yes, your no be no, because we walk in truth. The Bible doesn't forbid swearing all oaths, only against swearing of deceptive, unwise, and flippant oaths. On occasion, God Himself makes oaths. Jesus said, don't swear by heaven in the New Testament and Sermon on the Mount. And an oath is permitted as it's approved by God Himself. But in that, there's something. One person said this, Tozer, that real faith never disappoints because it is in God, grounded on His character, promises, covenant, and oath. Somebody who says, uh, now, now, I want you to listen because I, I, I really mean this. I wonder if the thing they said just before that, did they mean that? Now, this is the honest truth. Was the thing you said before not the honest truth? I think the world needs to see that we function by our yes and we function by our no, and that is established in a heart with God, and that His promises are being lived out in our life, and His true Word is being lived out in our, work, in our, in our life. You may be persecuted. You may be canceled. You may have family members who don't even want to be around you anymore, but you can't compromise on the truth of God. You have to depend on Him. Psalms 89 says, I'll not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Again, the writer of Hebrews says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. He is dependable, my friends. His promises are true. So our livelihood, <clears throat> we depend on Him for that. Our patience, we depend on Him. James goes to an area that's very common, very understood, very recognized in the church, and that's this passage on prayer. He says, we have to depend on the Lord in our prayers. Take a look at verses 13 through 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? 
Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed a sin, he'll be forgiven. And therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it, as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So, depending on the Lord, we pray, depend on Him for a prayer over sickness and in suffering. Some of you have come to the elders in times of need, and we have anointed you with oil and prayed over you. That's a connection with the body. In the suffering, we pray to the Lord. When we're happy, we sing to the Lord. But when we're sick, we seek the body. If you are sick, seek the community around you, and the elders will pray for you. Something about the connectivity. It's not just that prayer, but it's the knowledge of your need that the body can meet. Several theologians take a look at this anointing of oil. And there's a spiritual dynamic of it that the Lord is saying to do so and pray in faith. But in first century thought process, some theologians think this is a medicinal thing, starting with the Egyptians, that oil has a healing property when you're not well. They say in this thing here, yes, you pray to the Lord when you're suffering. Yes, you sing to the Lord when you're suffering. Yes, you call the elders to pray. But also there's an element here, are you stupid enough not to seek medical health? and medical treatment. There's something there that God has given us through medicinals on the planet, through the discovery of, of surgical means, that if we just wipe them away and say, no, 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 it's a foolish thing. Even the writer of Luke and Acts was a physician. Jesus is a great physician. But there are times we come and we ask the elders to pray. Look at Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases. Lord, would that be the case? Yes. Recently, I did a memorial for my aunt, uh, Gracie, who passed away. She's the last of that generation. And I gave the teaching of the five healings. And I've taught that here in the church, and I've spoken of that before at different memorials that God gave us the white blood cells to heal our body. He gave us the crops and the, and the plants and minerals in order to bring out medicinals that would help heal our bodies. He gave intellect to the doctors to know the body and to be able to remove cancers and stuff to bring healing to our bodies. Every now and then, He'll do an immediate healing and all of a sudden you're completely recovered. I've seen healings like this done. And the fifth healing is heaven. There are no more diseases in heaven. There's no more sickness. There's no more sorrow. These five healings are there, and we trust the Lord for whichever one He wants to provide. It says we pray in faith. But not just here. There's something linked here with our sins as well. Confessing our sins. Verses 15 through 8, we have to depend on the Lord to forgive us our sins. He says He forgives all our iniquity and heals our diseases. Psalm 32 says, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. If we come to Him, He will forgive us. There's a word in here I want us to point out. It says, the prayer of the righteous has great power as it is working. Now, you may remember the text, if you memorize it in King James, the prayer of the righteous availeth much, availeth much. This is what this means is it's working. What's working? The prayer, the righteousness. It's the prayer of a righteous person. So it's not just a prayer that availeth much. It's the prayer of one who is walking and working in righteousness that availeth much. You say, well, I'm not a righteous person. Well, you're righteous in Christ. He has made you righteous in the eyes of the Father. 
Look at Romans 5. It says, for as by the one man's disobedience, speaking of Adam, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, speaking of Christ, the many will be made righteous. So in Christ we're made righteous, but are we walking in righteousness? Have we put on the armor of righteousness, the breastplate? Is our heart covered with that? Is it working in us? That's a key thing. He gives the example of Elijah. I love the fact that and Elijah is one of the great ones, man. He's one of the big ones. He says, he's just like you and me. He's a regular guy. But he prayed, and God answered. The last area that James looks at here is about reconciliation. I love this end thought. Because we've started the very whole journey with, are you in Christ? Are you abiding in Christ? Are you asking correctly of God? As you're going through suffering, are you leaning into Him, asking Him wisdom? Because this is going to impact you in the days of your life in dealing with others. And as you're depending on Him for this, He's bringing others into your life. His intent is for you to be out and about and Him bringing people into your life. Because as you walk in wisdom, as you walk in truth, as you walk in light, as you walk in love, if you walk in not being partial, as you, as you walk in not being judgmental, as you walk in the fact that He alone is the answer and you depend on Him, He's giving you opportunities to be a minister of reconciliation. People need you. People at your school, at your work, in your neighborhood, in your home, they need you to be the light Christ called you to be. So we depend on the Lord that we might be reconcilers. Look at these last few verses in James 5. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings them back, let them know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. My uncle was an evangelist, and I traveled with him in the summers. I probably sat under preaching every summer, every night. <laughs> Three months, every single year of my life, every single night. That's a lot of sermons. And at the end of the service, there would be an altar call. And one of the songs, probably the second song that was asked to be played was Rescue the Wandering, old, old hymn. God wants you to be an agent of rescuing the wandering. And when I say that right now, you have someone's name on the tip of your tongue. Someone you love and care about just entered your mind. They have wandered from the truth. God says, as you abide in me and as my wisdom is in you and as you move through how to handle relationships and treat people rightly and fairly and move through how people want to bring quarrels and you just drive through it with love and truth, that these are the ways and your genuine faith being evidence that maybe the wanderer will see truth rather than falsehood because you say one thing and do another. That's why the very core of James is faith without works is dead. What you do matters as much and even more than what you say. If we say one thing and do another, we're hypocrites and the world is full of them and they say the church is full of them because we're not living out the life as a reconciler, as an agent of Christ. Galatians 6 says, Brothers, if anyone's caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of beating them up. The largest King James Bible you can find, thump them on the head with it. Quote as many scriptures to make them feel as small as they possibly can. Is that how the text reads? 
in a spirit of rage, spirit of anger, spirit of warfare, spirit of I've got the truth and you're not listening to me, in the spirit of gentleness, truth spoken gently. James starts off the thing, if any of you lack wisdom, let him come to God and he will give it to you graciously. And in my paraphrase, not making you feel like an idiot because you didn't have the answer. And that's the way we're supposed to approach people who are wandering with a spirit of gentleness we restore them. They are wandering. I think sometimes this has to do with the person who has been in church. They've known the truth in some regard and they've walked away. They need to be drawn back with love and gentleness and restoring them. That seems to be the gist of this text in Paul's letter in Galatians. But then he moves not just to the wanderer, but the lost. Rescue the lost. Wow. They don't even know they need rescuing. They don't even believe they need rescuing. How do we speak into their hearts? The word here is rescue. Bring a sinner back. Save his soul. And I think therein lies the truth of it. If you try to lead somebody back to the Lord with mental debates, you will not draw them back. They will draw lines and try to find some apologetics and modern things and science says this and I can do this and I have that and I'm this way and that, all that and this truth and this all that. You've got to talk to the soul because the soul was placed into man by the breath of God. And when you speak the words of the Spirit gently, you are driving through all the peripheral and the foolishness and the arguments, and you're touching the spark of the individual who was made in the image of God and something deep in the recesses that long since have been forgotten will be rising up like a fountain to receive the truth of the Word that restores and saves their soul. We are so caught up in the bantering, in the debating, in the arguing, in the lines in the sand, and your thought of a fact versus my thought of a fact, and your position over my position, when the soul has got to be touched. And that's a spirit thing. That's a gentle Holy Spirit nudging thing that we can reconcile the lost. Every week, I close the service out. You might get tired of it. Maybe it's just me, but I love it. It's a verse that made such an impact in my life. As a young person in the church we were growing at, the youth group was called Christ Ambassadors. There was a whole song that went with that. We are Christ ambassadors, you know, <laughs> all fun. But this verse meant a lot to me. So every Sunday I say, as you go out there, know that you're Christ ambassadors, and then I say, what? Be a good one. And it comes from this text. Listen to it out of 2 Corinthians as Paul writes his letter to the church in Corinth. He says, therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of His reconciliation. Therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ. Listen to that word. God making His appeal 
through us. That's weighty. That's heavy. He says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The question always comes up, says, well, ho, the Bible talks about those who were elect. So if God already knows their elect and the number of those who are going to be saved, why therefore do we even think about evangelism or sharing the gospel? Because the number of those who are elect has been established interesting question, it's asked a lot. The fact that God knows who's going to be saved is paramount and legitimate and written in Scripture. But here's the thing we need to understand. God declares to us the means by which they are going to be saved. How can they be saved unless they hear? How can they hear unless a preacher is sent? There is a means by which God is partnering with us for Him to bring His Word. Yes, He knows who the elect is, but by the process of you and I making His appeal to them, that's the way He has chosen to do it. That's the defense of Paul's entire ministry and your ministry and my ministry. He's making His appeal through us. And in this process, we'll save the soul. Now, you can look look this up, and it's a whole lot of fun to look it up as to what they're meaning here. Because you can look at it in two different ways just reading it like that. Say, well, okay, he's talking about saving the soul that you just rescued and sins are covered. Or you could look at it as by doing this, you're saving your own soul and your sins are covered. You know what the answer is? Both. Thank you, Pastor John. <laughs> nice to have a fellow theologian in the mix. <laughs> you can't help it. <laughs> it's awesome. Both. Their soul is saved. Because you have peeled the heart of God into their soul and restored it, reconciled it. And yours is saved. How so? How is my soul saved from death in that? Because I'm partnering in life every single minute. I get to witness you into a new creation you into a new creation. Your old ways are passed away. Your old ways are passed away. You're reconciled with God, and my soul is enriched. And the more I'm engaged in this, the less I have time for the foolishness of this world. You want to say, Pastor Dave, how do I get victory over sinning all the time? Well, why don't you get about doing the work that God called you to? The more you work at being a reconciler of grace and gentility, the less you're going to sin. You know why? Because you won't have time for that garbage. Your heart won't be on it. Your mind won't be on it. Your hands won't go to it. Your feet won't walk to it because you are on a path of reconciliation. That's dependence on the Lord. For your livelihood, for your patience, for your prayer life, to be an ambassador of Christ, to reconcile others. Psalms 32 says this, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. That means happy, that word blessed. And a well-known passage I close with in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I offer this challenge, and then we'll close in prayer. And if the Holy Spirit's been working on you in any of these points, that will be the moment in our prayer time to come before the Lord and move into His presence and feel the abiding power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life in the area that He's working on in your life. And you respond to Him. But here's my challenge to you and me. I'll steward my finances 
for the glory of God. As little as you got, or as much as you got, it all belongs to the Lord. I will look for the Lord's return with patience in my struggles and with compassion on others. I will go to the Lord for strength through suffering, prayer for healing, and confession of sins. Always. This is not a once done when you were a child and it's all said and done. This is an attitude of abiding in Him that I go to Him for strength and suffering, prayer for healing, and confession of my sins. And finally, I'm going to follow the Lord's guidance to meekly restore those who need to be reconciled with God. Thank you, James, for this letter. Thank you, Lord, that you led James to write this to the church, the early church, and it's so applicable to us as the modern church. Very practical teachings, all abiding and depending. Pray with me, would you please? Father, I know that when we have a text that deals with various points, they are all related to depending on you in these things here, but they are diverse. So I pray that as they were talked through, taught through, explored, that you would have illuminated certain things into the hearts of individuals here. It may be one truth, it may be two. And in this moment, Holy Spirit, would you speak in such a way that it would be heard in the manner in which each would receive. And as you share this area of growth, this area of giving, this area of dependence, that we would not balk against it, we would not stiff arm you, we would not ignore it, but we would look at it as in a mirror and then to deal with it. We ask for your strength, Lord God, as we depend on you for these things, to not go in our own strength, our own ability, our own knowledge, our own understanding, but your wisdom and your spirit that will give us the words in the right moment the right attitude with the right fruit in all the things we do. Today, Lord God, I pray that you would restore those who might have been wandering. They have bought into the lies of the world, how tantalizing they are, how seemingly compassionate they may be, wherein they're leading people to death. Help us, Lord God, to return to your truth, return to your love, Return to your way. Call us back. Lord, we repent of the sins in our lives and offer them to you. We're thankful for forgiveness. And Lord, as we break away from these doors, may we be different than when we came. More encouraged by the word that's spoken into our life. Closer to the image of Jesus because of the change in our life by your work, dear Lord. As we go out these doors, Lord God, may the light that was hiding become a light that is flaming so the world might see your love. They might be restored to you. The wanderers returning, the lost coming to you, and souls saved from death. I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, beloved, I'm so excited about what's going to happen next. We, we've uh, eaten from the Word today. That's good. I had my coffee this morning. That prepped me. I had my prayer. That prepped me. Now we've had the Word and the worship, and we're going to have some grub, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. I want to thank those of you who joined us today. If you've been blessed by the ministry, there's a way there to steward some of your funds as the Lord leads you to give to the church. Those of you who are so faithful and generous at this time of the year as we come to the end of the year, there's a means by which you can give. You know, we uh, have many missionaries around the world, around the country, church planners that we support. Of course, the seven or eight different ministries we have here in our partnership that these facilities are allowing to be a lighthouse to our area. We're grateful for your generosity. You're such a giving and loving people. Uh, thank you again for all you did for the Christmas shoe box. Again, 52 boxes came in. That went out. I'm going to ask you to stand right now. And as we break away from here, 
We're going to be going straight down the hall to the very far room, Ellis Chapel, and there will be food awaiting for us. Let me just say that I will ask the Lord that the prayer that I offered for our souls would also be sufficient for our food. He has offered that. You've provided that. We're grateful for that, and we give thanks to Him as we go. Go out those doors. You're ambassadors of Christ's. Be good ones.